So my name is Tony O'Keefe and I'll be chairing today's session with Michael Garrity, President of Ashray Ireland. So here's the agenda for today's webinar. Um, I'll give a short introduction and uh, some general information before handing over to our panelist, Mr. Brendan Reddington, uh, on the topic to examine the importance of ventilation as an engineering control mechanism in the fight against COVID-19 and to examine the common ventilation related parameters referred to in numerous reports and guidance documents that influence its effectiveness. There will be a 10 to 15 minute Q&A after that to follow up and some closing announcements. So just in relation to some, um, I suppose, some general information, the questions tab, everyone's, um, everyone is muted by default and there's a question tab on the right hand side. So if you do have questions, please um, input them in the questions tab and get, if you can, get them as early as possible so that we have an opportunity to get to them um, during the presentation. If we don't, um, we will follow up afterwards with, um, with, uh, with, with, with emails. You can access PDF downloads. Um, I will load them up into the handout section there shortly and, um, and the, the presentation will be available to download later on also. Um, when we finish the seminar, there will be a short survey goes out to all attendees with three questions on it. So we'd really appreciate your feedback on that. It helps us prepare for future um, webinars. So just in relation to, um, I suppose, the actual response to COVID-19, there's a lot of documentation available. Um, there's references um, to the ASHRAE guidance, SIBSI, Riva, and a number of others. The links that you can see here, the live, the, the highlighted, um, Word, words are live links and once you've downloaded the slides you'll be able to go directly to those resources. So uh, we've been very lucky with um, I suppose the quality of speakers um, over the course of this uh, COVID-19 mini-series. Um, it has run every two weeks and this is our, our final day with, with Brendan, our final webinar. Um, all of the previous webinars are available to download um, from the Ashtray Ireland website. So if you go in and follow the webinar tab, you'll be able to, to find those. So there's like, like that, if you've missed any of them, there's some very interesting um, discussions from IAQ monitoring to facility management to, to air filtration and so on. There's a lot of other information about, um, Ashtray, look, Ashtray, Ashtray is a, an organization that's over hundred years old. So there's a lot of, there's a real depth of, and breadth of, of technical resources available as a member and uh, as a non-member. So I'd encourage you to, fo again, follow the links and, and, and uh, review some of the resources that are available. As a starting point, to navigate your way into the, I suppose, the, the, the amount, there's an awful lot of information in, in ASHRAE and to, to navigate um, the, 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 the amount of documentation, this infographic is, is very useful. So it's, there's live links, each of the, um, the icons that you can see are live links that will bring you to different parts of the documentation. This in particular is around pandemic and COVID-19, but um, it also is relevant for, for all different topics covered by ASHRAE. So the, the Learning Institute is where Ashray um, provides courses and education um, resources. Again, look, if it's the best way to, to, to look into this and to review it is to follow the link or go onto the Ashray website and you'll be able to, to find them. There's some very interesting topics covered. So what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to hand over, um, I'm going to introduce Michael Garrity. He's going to, well, Michael Garrity is going to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Brendan Reddington. So if I can unmute you, Michael, if you're available. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm not hearing Michael. So what I will do is I will give Brendan a myself. Um, or, so Brendan is the HSC's manager for quality standards, quality and standards, and has over 27 years of experience in the areas of, um, sorry, there no second, um, in the areas of engineering design, project management, facilities management in the healthcare management sector, as well as other high tech and, and industrial settings. He sits on many building service engineering healthcare standards committees at national, European, and international level. 
He has contributed to many standards, guidance documents, and articles on healthcare engineering. Now I'm going to hand back to Michael or Brendan. My apologies. At this point. Um, or, so Brendan is the HSC's manager for quality standards, quality and standards, and has over 27 years of experience in the areas of. Um, sorry, there no second. Um, in the areas of engineering design, project management, facilities management in the healthcare management sector, as well as other high tech and, and industrial settings. He sits on many building service engineering healthcare standards committees at national, European and international level. He has contributed to many standards, guidance documents and articles on healthcare engineering. Now I'm going to hand back to Michael or Brendan, my apologies, at this point. So my name is Brendan Reddington. I'm an engineer with estates in Galway. You okay, Michael? All right, I crack on. Okay. And um, I was asked by Ashra to do a presentation, a high level overview of all the guidance and, and standards that's out there. Um, so there's my qualifications. So what I'm doing today is I'm going to examine the importance of ventilation as an engineering control mechanism in the fight against COVID-19 and to examine the common themes running through all these documents, which can be confusing for a lot of people. There's my disclaimer. Just a clarification that this is a technical presentation. It's not an infection control presentation. There are others that give the national guidance from a national pers perspective. This is just on a ventilation um, um, overview, desktop study of all the guidance that's come out there and to show the common team running through all these guidance documents. Here's some of them, it's not all of them, but I'll be dipping into all of these throughout the presentation and examining the common teams running through all of them. Um, so as of the ASHRAE guide, guide, uh, website as of last Friday, they have given the, the WHO view, the CDC view, and their own view. And within their own guidance, they've given the assurance that they do not conflict with WHO or CDC positions, but they do highlight the importance of engineering controls. So what can we do? This is from a previous ASHRAE um, presentation, and it hasn't changed. We apply established um, principles of risk management um, we apply existing knowledge about aerosol airborne disease transmission. We apply um, established principles for control exposure to airborne contaminants. We apply established principles of risk management and be willing to change our views based on um, emerging knowledge and recognize that all of the available guidance is a starting point and we are still responsible for applying it. Uh, and that's all subject to the risk assessment. So the risk management um, graph there was introduced by um, ASHRAE before. Um, so that still applies. And you can see engineering controls sits right in the middle of it. Another important piece, although PPE sits below engineering controls, the importance of face masks and PPEs is vital. And you can see from this previous presentation from ASHRAE, the higher the efficacy of the face mask, and that brings in how well it's worn and the type, and the more people that wear it, the lower the risk. Riva have the same engineering controls as, as, as their smack in the middle near the top. And we've always had um, engineering controls, people ongoing cleaning and disinfection. Uh, parameters within clean control environments. We've always had the risk of infection within clean control environments. We've always had this. And we've always had the risk of infect the, the web of infection and risk assessment. We've always had that. So what infection control people try and do is break break the links. And that's that's what they try to do, but I'm not talking about that today. So it's not new to us in, in, in the healthcare side. Now, going back to COVID-19, in, in January, WHO issued guidance on ventilation and they highlighted the need for ventilation and particularly where aerosol generating procedures are taking place and they look for 12 air changes, uh, mechanical ventilation or 160 litres per second per patient. 
they referenced the 2009 guidance, WHO, and that gave us some useful definitions about this quantum generation rate by an infected person. Defined droplets, it defined droplet nuclei, and it defined air changes. And they also produced some very useful tables which highlighted the importance of ventilation and time, exposure, and risk. All of the, they also quantified quanta per minute, quanta per hour for various procedures. That was in a healthcare setting. Similarly, for a healthcare setting, in infection control, the highlight is the quantum emission rates for different procedures, the ventilation rate, and the exposure time, and how the risk came down based on the higher the ventilation rate and time. Now, a more recent study which brought in some of that WHO data was in May in Italy, and they were able to show the, the results They were able to show the importance. So, just to be clear, here. let's move this out of the way. So they were able to show the importance of this dose or emission rate from people. So the results show that a high quanta emission rate can be reached by asymptomatic infections subject to performing vocalization during light activity. So the higher the activity, the higher the dose. And the results obtained from simultaneous clearly highlight that ventilation is very important. Seem to be just stuck here now, one second. It's not moving from the instruction to show screen. Okay, so we're moving again. Um, okay. I just seem to have lost control of the screen here. Just one second. Mm -hmm. Can you move the slides down for me, Donald? Brendan, 
what I'll try and do is disconnect you as a presenter and then reconnect you, see if that helps. I, I've given the keyboard and mouse to you now. I, I, I don't have your presentation, so I won't be able to adjust your presentation, but, but one moment here. I've given you, okay, it's just not moving down for me here. Have you control there now? Second. Yeah, I have control. Can you hear me? I'll just turn back on the video. Yeah, we can indeed, Brendan. Thank you. All right. So what the Italian report did, it went back over the 2009 data and came up with more evidence based on COVID-19. It highlighted the great importance of ventilation in indoor microenvironments to reduce the spread of infection. This isn't moving again, Donal. Um, can you move it down for me, Donal? No, Brendan, I, I don't have any control over your laptop, unfortunately. Um, so I, I'll just disconnect again if you want to try that. Right, okay. You okay now? Yeah, you might try again, Brendan. Okay, so it's moving. Now, if anybody wants to read that presentation, there's the link, but, but this graph showed the importance of ventilation after lockdown. You can see natural ventilation, mechanical ventilation, and after lockdown, the RO figure really came down, but it showed the importance of ventilation for a pharmacy, a supermarket, a restaurant, post office in the bank. We had this last week, it's the Wells Riley model, and they came up with new data based on quantum emission rate, which you can see the higher the activity, more speaking, more shouting, etc., the higher the emission rate, and that's very important. They also produced graphs to show that based on occupancy and the higher the ventilation rate, the higher the probability of infection. And we have it there again. And that's all tying in with all the previous slides, it's all linking up. Ventilation is very important. Occupancy is a factor, the lower the probability of infection. There are some more studies. I'm just going to skip over them because we're tight in time, but they all prove the importance of ventilation. As does this one from Finley, which proved the importance of ventilation. As do these reports. Uh, this report, transmission of the virus by droplets and aerosols is, is a critical review of the unresolved uh, highlights of SARS. So it, they all prove the importance of ventilation and, and the COVID uh, research shows it's believed to linger in the air for extended period. This one deals with the surfaces and this one deals with the world should face the reality that the airborne risk is, is real. We also have this report which also um, examined the importance of ventilation and the, and, the, and the significance of the airborne transmission route. And then work that I do in Europe with different organizations also say that SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory virus, which uh, predominantly spreads through droplets. There is secondary contamination. The virus can remain infectious on surfaces and the virus can remain infectious in the air for several hours. 
here's all the references. But this ties in with previous ASHRAE presentations where we've known that sneezing, coughing, talking, and the highest risk there is with sneezing. There's also an interesting study there from, from 1945, which showed influenza have a 50% of the viral load less than five microns. So for five microns, maybe previously it was believed they didn't carry a high load, but for influenza they do. And this study showed that for SARS, uh, um, COVID-2, yes, they do. If you look at that research from China, it shows that the smaller droplets um, are, are of concern and they do carry the viral load. And we had this previously again from Riva. And then on relative humidity, there was research done in 1986. And this, we had this previously, which showed the sweet, sweet spot in the middle. But the important piece here is at lower RH, you get the faster droplet evaporation. Uh, the desiccation of the mucosa, which is reducing your own um, um, infection uh, protection system. So it reduces how well you can protect yourself. Uh, the lower RH dries out the, the, the mucosa, which causes a, a reduction in your own defense mechanisms and increases susceptibility. And then you get the longer uh, survival. So humidity is a factor. Um, this was picked up in SIBSI. It was picked up in uh, CDC 2003. Reva gave a slightly different view, but I believe uh, Stephanie Taylor's research is wider, wider bandwidth, and they're not exactly saying the same thing. So Reva do pick up on this, on humidity. And um, in this slide, they are saying very similar issues. And really, we want to try and keep humidity above 25 to 30%, maybe a higher, a higher level of, of 70%. But again, every situation needs to be risk assessed. And this is what this previous slide from Ashley said. Every situation needs to be looked at in its own merits. And we do that. And we have done that in the past. And we have installed humidifiers and specialist healthcare applications with clean steam. But again, it's on a case by case basis. But the new research is showing that humidity does need to be looked at again. And I'm aware that HTMO3 are updating their guidance and they'll probably look at it within the document. So microorganism basics are explained within SIBSI Team 14 2006, and they do um, acknowledge the different um, particle sizes, micron sizes, and droplet nuclei, and the particles settle at a rate proportional to their size. Um, SIBSI picked up on this in, in April uh, 2020 and recognized that ventilation is very important. And also in July 2020, they gave an update, and there was um, an acknowledgement by the WHO on the 9th of July. Simply also picked up on the importance of risk assessments, which we had earlier, but they need to be done by Compton people, Compton engineers. And they also acknowledge the importance of UBC as a possible treatment, but it's all dependent on, on the science behind it. And that is time, intensity, and distance. Ashley gave guidance on this. And here's some guidance that you can read. I won't get time to go through today because we're tied for time, but you do need to consider this before installing UVGI and there's a lot more research to be done on this. So it's simply have examined this in poorly ventilated areas, occupants are exposed to higher concentrations of airborne pathogens and the risk will increase with a greater amount of time spent. So again, we're all saying the same thing throughout these documents, we're all saying the same thing. Risk is dependent on exposure and time. So in any risk assessment, you need to understand your ventilation system and you need to be careful with any energy saving measures put into the system like CO2 set points. You need to keep the system running. Local exhaust systems are effective in catching the source locally, but you need to watch and be careful and understand where the air is coming from. So as I explained earlier, CO2 set points need to be lowered to keep the system on. SIBSI also acknowledge relative humidity. Room air cleaners are acknowledged within SIBSI, but they have to be HEPAs and they have to be to the standard that Campbell explained on previous um, ASHRAE presentations. They do acknowledge UBC as well. Local exhaust is important, particularly where you have AGPs. And uh, by catching the, the source locally and dumping it in, 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 to a safe location is important. Ventilation effectiveness is important because you need to know that you've good dilution and good mixing in the room. In, in the room. Simply give guidance on this. Clean air devices um, are acknowledged in numerous documents, but again, they have to be 
to the HEPA filtration standard. Provided they cause no harm and are well maintained, they will greatly improve indoor air quality and reduce risk. So we also had the Specialist uh, Ventilation Healthcare Society. They produced guidance and again, they acknowledged the airborne dilution risk. They referenced um, CDC documents and they also acknowledged droplet nuclei and the size based on the, the size and the rate at which they fall is acknowledged. But again, very similar guidance. Uh, they use the CDC, so the 63% figure there, I'll go through that in a second. And the ASHRAE also produced guidance that while ventilation systems cannot interrupt um, the larger dro droplets, they, they can influence the transmission of droplet nuclei. So the larger ones are close to the source and ventilation in the main can't influence that too much, but it's the smaller ones they can influence. ASHRAE gave guidance on this on the particle settling in still air. And we have that as well, and you can read that in your own time. So the CDC has approved UVGI in support of filtration. And I, I'd be thinking that you should have your filtration before it or your HEPA filtration before it. And the UVGI does its work to kill the virus. And they have evidence level A there from that document, which is, which is very good. Then you have the um, European Centre for Diseases, it's the ECDC. And they, again, ref refer to the public health guidance, which is distancing, hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, and the use of masks. They do acknowledge ventilation, and they do acknowledge its importance, and they go through a whole series of cases where uh, airborne infection is identified, or at least thought to be identified. Through all these examples, you can, again, you can read them in your own time, but there are numerous examples here where airborne transmission has been identified. It was the choir in Washington, the restaurant in China, which is well spoken about at this stage in previous presentations. They do acknowledge in hospitals the risk to lower because in the main we have good ventilation which follows HTMO, HTMO03. And um, that's vital. Uh, the ventilation again is vital and you have this adequate number of liters per second per person. The, the ECDC again give the example of the temple and the bus ride journey where the uh, infections occurred, to give the example of the workshop, and they do highlight the importance of HEPA filtration, which again, the science behind it is solid, uh, that the right filters, correctly installed, the right standard, will catch the particles that we're worried about. In conclusion, the CDC have issued these points, which you can go through, but they all highlight the importance of ventilation. So then we had the reveal document in August the 3rd, 2020, Again, the changes were, were acknowledged previously because uh, COVID-19 has now been considered an airborne virus. Improved ventilation is fundamental. Filtration standards were better defined. And again, picking up on the new standards, the EPM1, which is what we need to be specifying for healthcare projects. Reva also picked up on the importance of risk assessment, droplets, and also picked up on the importance that the larger particles fall closer to 1.5 meters and the smaller ones hang around for a distance further than that. With previous slides, we showed the importance of how the larger particles fall and the smaller ones travel. In summary there, you can see it, that the droplet nuclei, which are the smaller ones, hang around, the virus sits inside the larger particle, dries out, and it can travel in the air. The larger particles fall. So that, that distinguishes airborne droplets in contact. That's just showing the size of PM1 and the size of the SARS-CoV-2 um, droplet nuclei that we're talking about, which is 0.12 to one micron. So again, the airflow can influence the, the speed which depends on for coughing or sneezing, but also airflow rate direction and control is important. Reva rec recognized the droplet nuclei, which we spoke about earlier, and the 1.5 meter distance that we showed in the graphs above. We had this previously where ventilation pulls down the concentration and reduces the risk. And we had the WHO acknowledgement. 
with the open letter from the 239 scientists and the acknowledgement from the WHO that aerosol transmission has been added. We even give a summary, which is very good, again acknowledging the importance of ventilation and engineering controls. And they also do identify in the more recent guidance the importance of room air cleaners with HEPA. There are the REVA references. IHEAM also give guidance in September 2020, which do highlight split air units and concern around their use in critical care areas. CDC give an update in July 2019. And in that, they do again highlight the importance of HEPA filtration, which can be used to supplement ventilation. But ventilation should be the first choice. And where you don't have adequate ventilation, the correct HEPA filtration will assist in reducing risk. So that is acknowledged. They do acknowledge engineering controls. And there's the engineering controls that they're speaking about, all of the ones that I spoke about earlier. They do acknowledge UVGI. And we spoke about UVGI previously. And uh, once it's in the right wavelength, but you do need to look at the factors I discussed earlier in terms of intensity, time, distance. For guidance on UVGI, you need to refer to the ASHRAE guidance. All the literature and data you need, and I've listed all the relevant guidance there. They do acknowledge recirculation devices with HEPA, which can be used to supplement uh, ventilation, or if you don't have ventilation, and they do recognize it. And again, it is recognized back in 2003, CDC acknowledges. it. This is the table within Appendix B of the CDC, and you can see the higher the air changes, um, the better the reduction in airborne concentration and the shorter the recovery time. So at um, 10 air changes there, you can see 28 minutes and the higher the air changes, uh, the shorter the time that you can use the room. But it must be, um, the UK NT document also refers to this um, CDC table as do UK public health and the 63% figure of one-year changes. And there's the calculations of where they worked it out. But it must be remembered that this is based on a ventilation effectiveness dilution factor of one, which we'd have in most hospitals because we comply with the HTM. But for other applications, you need to take this into account. And this is why you'd be advocating for critical care applications or where you have AGPs that source uh, capture and exhaust or low level exhaust makes sense to me in, in a sense that you're driving the, the droplet down. It's falling naturally through gravity anyway, the larger ones, which are the high risk, but you're driving, you're driving it down and not pulling the air across the breathing zone. I, I think that makes sense. But in the HSE, we have our AHU specification. We generally have two filters, F7, F9 and HEPA if we need it, but the risk is not outside, the risk is inside. Here's a graphic which shows our natural defense mechanisms against airborne infection. So, and again, we're really concerned about PM1 and how the smaller particles PM1 can enter into the lungs and into the alveoli and cause health implications. The bigger ones, 10 micron plus, your natural defenses will keep them out. So it's the PM1s, PM2.5s, which are of concern. And that's the territory we're in, and that's, that's where the HEPAs come in. We had this last week, or a couple of presentations ago from Campbell, which identified the importance of HEPA and the 0.1 to 0.2 micron um, testing standard for EN1822 and the 0.12 to 1 micron size is what we're concerned about. They show the importance of HEPAs on this graph and the standards. And the new standards for bag panels is 18690. There it is there. Three simple rules reported. Efficiency, to be able to report the initial efficiency needs to be over 50% and to be able to report that the discharge efficiency needs to be over 50%. So in summary, we need EPM1 for bag panels for healthcare. This also brings in 16798-3, which 
which for uh, SUP1, ODA3, which would be a poor outer air quality, you're looking at F7, F9. We also have the HPSC guidance on, on uh, acute healthcare high risk applications. So there is guidance up online on that, and that is the national guidance for, for hospitals. There's other guidance there around buildings, and they would reference all the UK guidance documents. And we have our guidance for um, prevention of nosocomial aspergillus from 2018, which picks up on the neutral and negative pressure rooms. So sometimes it's a combination that's required between UV and, and HEPA filters. And the previous slides show the, 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 the life cycle cost and the importance of that. Uh, there's a balance to be reached as to how, if you have good ventilation and you want to add HEPA filtration, then there's a balance to be reached. So with COVID transmission, we know what we're dealing with in terms of the size. People are aware of the airborne or the aerosol transmission and the impact of HVAC systems. So in summary then, we need to follow the public health advice because that's, that's the first priority. Remember the social distancing, cleaning and disinfection PPE, your testing and tracing, avoid confined spaces with large crowds, beware of activity levels. Remember the time by exposure slides that I had previously. The risk assessment needs to be done by competent people, but avoid the risk. Remember the, the graphic where we showed you need to avoid the risk if possible. Engineering controls and provide good air dilution, ventilation, treatment, filtration, as per the guidance above. Embrace new technology, air treatment, but it has to be based on evidence-based data by competent people and, and independent insurance and ensure that they cause no harm or the systems that are installed are maintained to make sure that they cause no harm. You also need to look at the life cycle costs and life cycle performance because you need to get the best value for your book here in terms of investment. And you always need to ask, is it evidence-based, independent and IPC approved? Any of these systems now going into hospitals particularly need to be IPC approved. And it's, it's, it's more of an integrated, coordinated approach that's required in collaboration with public health. So I think we're heading for a quarter to two. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I'll turn back on the camera now. Thanks so much, Brendan. That was really interesting. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I'll just wait there and I'll see if any questions come in. While I'm waiting, I'll just cover some closing announcements and if there's any questions, we can, we can pop back to them. So I'll just pass over, I'll just go over to take a presentation there. Okay, um, there, just to cover a, a few items before we wrap up, um, the Ashbury IAQ conference that was set for um, this month um, was obviously cancelled due to COVID-19 and has been rescheduled for 2021. They have also added a number of topics around ventilation. So if there's anyone wants to contribute or possibly attend, I think it will, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to. And it'll be a, a very interesting um, conference. Um, the technical committees, um, there's a few questions coming in there. So, uh, technical committees are an important element in, in ASHRAE, and they're, the, I suppose, where uh, the, the, the core references, the core, the core information comes from. Um, there's a number of, um, of areas where. Uh, um, covers the, the, the breadth of areas that uh, technical committees are involved with and they, they influence the development of all the, the, the specification documentation and so on. So again, they're a, a great um, part of Ashbury and a very important um, aspect to it. I'm going to go back to you now, Brendan, and um, just cover a few questions while they, they come in. Um,
Okay, so this just, I suppose, just basic housekeeping. Um, there will be a copy of the slides um, provided afterwards. Um, unfortunately, we, we weren't able to, we had some technical challenges today, and I apologize again for that, we weren't able to load them up. Um, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll continue on with the, um, the, the closeout, so, because there isn't any questions coming through, Brendan. That's fine. Great. Um, okay. So uh, the board, um, Michael Garrity is president, um, Ken Goodman in, in the vice president role. Um, we, uh, we are looking for a treasurer. Um, so if there is people interested, please do make contact with us to, if they're interested in joining the board. Uh, if you want to follow Ashbury, um, the best way to do so is to register for our mailing list and um, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn or YouTube. All of the previous webinars will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, again, uh, the sponsors are very, very important to us. They, um, this is a voluntary organization and the sponsorship uh, so keeps the whole thing going. So thank you again to all of those sponsors. And if there is any other information required, um, please do contact us. Um, So, is there is one question here, Brendan, if you don't mind taking okay. it. Um, yeah. What is the recommendation for ventilation rates in offices? If you wanted to offer anything on that, Brendan. In offices? Offices, correct. Um, Seems so you give, gives the guidance in offices. Um, but if you go to the if you go to the CDC guide, it shows the higher the ventilation rate, the quicker it cleans out the area, the lower the risk. So I'd follow the CDC guidance. I won't give you a figure off the top of my head, but the, the social distancing is important. So if you keep your distance, um, try and control your direction of airflow. It's not just about air changes as well as controlling the direction of airflow. So if there is a source that you can try and capture it locally. Um, obviously, research is a concern now. You probably don't want to do it. Um, so dilution brings down the risk big time. If you look at that CDC table I sent you, and look at the air changes as they go up, and how the concentration comes down, but it's based on ventilation effectiveness. And let that be the basis of your decision. Um, that's the best evidence I can find uh, but it's based on a ventilation effectiveness figure of one, so it's probably more likely to be somewhere between 0.5 and 0.7. So I'd follow the, um, the SIBC guidance on that, but also look at that table and then look at your, it's not just about air changes, it's about your distancing and maybe staggering the staff so they all don't arrive in the one day. There was a number of um, previous presenters mentioned CO2. Is that um, a method you've... It is, um, yeah. Well, CO2 is an indicator of obviously the amount of people in the room and um, ventilation um, rates so it is an indicator but it's it's still just co2 um it's an indicator that's that's as much as i can say about it for now but it is a good indicator to use and one of the first slide you're trying to link it back to infection risk and that's difficult to do because if you have one one asymptomatic or covid positive case in the room Okay, the CO2 may be low, but still a risk. So it's an indicator. That's as much as I'd say about it. Um, there's another one here. Uh, you might give an opinion on how do you control fresh air in a school with natural ventilation? Um, I read somewhere, and I, 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 this is just my own view, that they need to open the windows in the schools earlier in the morning <laughs> to purge the room, and again in the evening. Don't Don't just open them before they arrive in or as they go home you need to purge the room the ventilate the air changes is based on how far the windows open and prevailing winds that's difficult to measure maybe if you have a velocity meter by the area but that's unpredictable because the wind changes throughout the day so you can get an estimate of air changes um whether it's two three air changes i don't know it depends on the prevailing winds but you need to try and get some directional airflow and dilution into the classrooms um again it's as per the dilution figures I've given you. Um, 
I would imagine CO2 would be a useful indicator in that case. Uh, the a useful indicator. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd recommend it. We had, that, we, had that yeah. we had that on previous presentations. It's a good indicator. And if your CO2 is getting up to the higher levels, then you need to do something about it. Uh, I, I presume, yeah, by having that information available, um, you could manage comfort and whilst also man managing ventilation. Yeah, it would be a good indicator. It'll tell you that when you need to open the windows or do something about it, or you need to be looking at mechanical ventilation, the CO2 level is continuously high in a room. Yeah, it's a very good indicator. I'd support that. Um, there's a question here from, um, so is air displacement ventilation or air mixing ventilation preferable well, to the HPC? Well, you see, the, the, the CDC charts I gave you were for mixing and dilution. And with, with, with adequate air changes, the risk is really low based on that um, table. But nevertheless, the larger droplets, i.e. 50, 100 micron, they drop as per the REVA guidance. 1.5 meter was the figure they had. They drop. So, and they are one of the high risk sources. So my view is, particularly in, in anywhere there's AGP's risk, which would be predominantly healthcare, um, from the business I'm in, in bronchoscopies, et cetera, I'd be, for those type of rooms, I'd be saying, pull it down, pull it down, because it's going to fall anyway. It's going to try and fall. So keep it down, catch it, and bend it. So I, I'd be advocating high level supply, low level, low level extract. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in now, Brendan. Um, I'd just like to thank you again for taking the time to, to speak today um, and apologies to yourself for the technical difficulties and for all the, the um, participants. Um, but we, we got through it and, and I really appreciate you taking your time. It was a very interesting presentation. Yeah, if, if there's anyone that wants to send a question uh, into yourself, uh, they can do that and we'll, we'll try and answer it later on. Absolutely. And, and we will follow with... Um, the handouts of the slides to all participants. Yeah. So I, I think that's it. Uh, I don't see any other questions coming through. So, so again, th thank you, Brendan, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Best of luck. Bye. Yeah.